All right, let's look at the quantum theory and the Bohr model of the atom. The warm-up says, <clears throat> list three properties of waves, such as water waves or visible light. Well, waves move through space and carry energy. They also have wavelengths. They have a frequency, they have an amplitude, and um, all those things can change. B, what would you expect to happen if two water waves moving in opposite directions meet each other? Well, they might pass through and interfere with each other. Um, they might cancel each other out. They might result in a single or a larger wave. Two, list three properties of solid objects or particles like marbles in a bag. <clears throat> marbles have definite boundaries. And um, we can count them in whole number quantities. What would you expect to happen if two marbles moving in opposite directions meet each other? Well, they will collide and bounce off of each other. And they would end up moving in different directions with different speeds. Number three, are any of your answers to question one identical to question two? Well, our answers probably can vary if we were doing this on our own. But let's take a look at waves behaving like particles. So Niels Bohr The, um, I'm in the wrong section, I'm sorry. There we go, okay. In the 1800s, the physics that was available at the time said that accelerating charges should give off energy. And electrons are accelerating charges. Electrons and atoms should technically lose energy and matter should collapse. So physics needed to be rewritten to explain the behavior of electrons. And Max Planck in 1900 proposed that energy could be shown to behave like particles. in the form of little discrete energy packets called quanta, which is plural for quantum. Planck called this the quantum theory. And Planck developed an equation for the energy that is associated with each packet or quantum, it is E equals HV. And E is energy, 
V is frequency and H, H is the proportionality constant called Planck's constant, 6.626 times 10 to the negative 34 joules per second. Now, <clears throat> according to Planck, energy could be absorbed or emitted in whole numbers of quanta. So if you think of each energy quantum as a glass marble in a bag of identical marbles, you can either add or remove a specific amount of marbles from the bag in whole number form. So the same thing applies for energy that can be absorbed or emitted in the form of whole numbers of quanta. And at the end of the 1800s, the behavior of waves and particles were seen very differently and mutually exclusive. So waves are disturbances that move through space, but they can pass through and interfere with each other. Or they could have any value within a range. And particles are objects with definite boundaries that bounce off of each other. They collide. They only exist and retain whole number quantities. And in 1905, Albert Einstein used the quantum theory to explain the photoelectric effect. Let me bring this down a little bit. And the um, photoelectric effect was considering that light is composed of little packets of energy called photons. And that um, this was the first application of the quantum theory. And soon it began to gain widespread acceptance. And in 1921, Einstein was awarded the Nobel Prize for his explanation of the photoelectric effect using the quantum theory. Now, if we take a look here at the quick check, briefly state what it means for something to be quantized. Well, it has particle like properties. And it exists in whole number amounts. It is also considered to be discontinuous. Give three common examples of things considered to be quantized. Well, how about eggs in a basket? students in a room, floors in a building, stairs in a staircase, number three, according to Planck, could an amount of energy equal to 2.5 HV be absorbed or emitted by an object? Explain. No, because that's a fractional number. Only whole number packets of energy can be absorbed or emitted. Now, let's talk about the Bohr model of the atom. So, Niels Bohr believed that the nuclear atomic model, in the nuclear atomic model, and he started to see a way to save it using quantum theory. So, if energy is quantized, that means it could, you could say that there could only be certain values of energy that could exist and not others. So, 
maybe the energies that were associated with electrons orbiting the nucleus had similar restrictions. So if we go to the next page, and we take a look here. When a high voltage was applied across the electrodes of a sealed glass tube containing a gas, when the gas is heated, it emits light. And Bohr looked at that light through a spectroscope. A spectroscope is a little tiny device that has a prism in it. And it separates the lights into its wavelengths. And Bohr viewed a series of colored lines against a black background. He didn't see a continuous rainbow of color, which would mean that there were various energies being observed corresponding to wavelengths. Now, for hydrogen, the same pattern of four colored lines was always seen. Red, blue, green, blue, and violet. Now, for each gaseous element, he saw a unique bright line pattern, which he called the bright line spectrum. And this always appeared, kind of like a barcode for a substance. And um, Bohr realized that if he applied the quantum principles to the behavior of hydrogen's one electron, he could account for why there was a bright line spectrum, and he could save Rutherford's nuclear model of the atom. Now, what were Bohr's postulates for hydrogen? They are given here. A hydrogen atom had certain allowed energy levels or stationary states, which corresponded to circular electron orbits of fixed sizes and energies associated with them. And every energy state is given a letter N. And Bohr called this N the quantum number. And these are allowed values that start at 1 and they come up to 2 and 3 and 4 the further you get from the nucleus. So the lowest energy or the smallest orbit, which is the ground state, has an n of 1. And the larger orbits are n equals 2, 3, and 4. And we call these the excited states. And as the electron moves from its stationary state to um, an excite, um, within its stationary state, it doesn't give off or absorb energy. But if it moves between energy levels, whatever the difference is between those energy levels, it will emit that energy when the electron relaxes back down to its stationary state. And I'm going to show you what this looks like on the next page. So let's take a look here. So here is my here is my electron. This little tiny um, blue dot here. This is the nucleus. This is n equals one. This is the lowest energy state closest to the nucleus. Then n equals two is further away, and n equals three is even further away. And what happens is the <clears throat> because only. Um, certain sized orbits are allowed, the atom is going to be restricted to existing in only certain energy states and not others. So the electron is restricted to these specific energies. And an atomic spectrum can't be continuous. It can't have a complete rainbow of colors because these energy states that are given here um, they can only have certain values. And when we heat a gas, the electrons absorb energy and they jump to a higher level. So for instance, an electron in n equals 2 can jump to, an to the n equals 3 level. And the amount of energy that it absorbed to accomplish that jump will be emitted when it relaxes. So it gets excited when it absorbs energy and it goes to the higher energy state. And then as it relaxes and comes back down, it is going to emit the energy that it had absorbed. And you will see that as a band of color. And 
if an excited electron emits energy and it drops from, let's say, that n equals 2 higher energy orbit, the wavelength of the emitted energy corresponds to a color of visible light. So you can see down here, A is, this is the emission for, um, this is the emission spectra for hydrogen, then we have mercury and neon. You'll notice that they're all different, they're all unique, like a fingerprint. Here, um, this is a continuous spectrum showing you all of the different colors, except do you see these little dark black regions here that are interrupting the color? If they weren't there, we would say this is continuous, but since they are there, we would say it's discontinuous. And up here, these are the emission spectra, whereas this is the absorption spectrum, okay? So you're seeing at what wavelengths um, you have energy being absorbed, whereas up here, this is the emission and this is what is being given off. And when the excited electron emits energy and it drops down from N equals 2 in uh, hydrogen, um, you're going to see a specific uh, band of color within a distinct region. Now, the for hydrogen, the red light that you're seeing right here, this is from the energy difference between n equals 3 and n equals 2. This was where the electron dropped between that energy. And so um, that doesn't take as much energy. And that's why you're seeing a longer wavelength because energy and wavelength are inversely related. And then the blue-green line over here, this is between the n equals 4 and n equals 2 transition. And then the uh, blue line here is from the n equals 5 to n equals 2 transition. And then this violet band of color on the end here is between n equals 6 and n equals 2. So it takes a lot more energy for an electron to jump between the second and sixth energy levels than the second and third energy levels. So that's why when this electron relaxes from the sixth energy level, you're going to see a band of color appearing on the short wa shorter wavelength region because shorter wavelengths actually have more energy. Okay, now some of the bright lines in the visible spectrum have a specific name. So I'm going to come over here to show you what this looks like. Now, when you have electrons Coming down to the n equals 1 level, these are called the Lyman series. Down to n equals 2, those are the Balmer series. N equals, coming down to n equals 3, the Passion, and coming down to n equals 4, those are the Bracket series. The Balmer series here, these are within the visible region. So any electron dropping down to n equals 2 happens within the visible region. Um, let's take a look at the quick check just underneath. Describe the appearance of hydrogen's bright line spectrum. Well, you have four colored lines. You're going to have red, blue, green, blue and violet against a black background. Number two, briefly indicate how electrons generate each visible line in hydrogen's emission spectrum. Well, an excited electron returns to the second energy level, which would be n equals 2, from higher levels by 
by emitting specific amounts of energy in the visible spectrum. And as the electrons return from the level 6, 5, 4, 3, and down to the second level, you're going to see a line for every transition. Three, which electron transitions in the emission spectrum generate lines in the UV region of the electromagnetic spectrum? Well, if you look just above at the figure, the Lyman series appear in the ultraviolet region. So anything coming down to N equals 1. So any electron transitions... from the excited states down to n equals 1 generates an emission line in the UV region of the electromagnetic spectrum. Abbreviated electromagnetic with EF. Now, in 1885, Johann Balmer found an equation to determine the wavelength, the wavelengths, I should say, of lines in the visible portion of hydrogen's emission spectrum. And three years later, Johann Rydberg derived an equation to calculate the wavelengths of all of hydrogen's spectral lines. So these equations are based on data rather than theory. And Niels Bohr, derive an equation for the energy that's associated with the electron. And um, the change in energy, which is delta E or triangle E, um, from an electron at a higher energy orbit dropping to a lower energy orbit, is given here. in an equation. So let me explain a couple things here. So when you have a higher energy orbit, that is n sub h. So this n sub h here is your higher energy orbit. And your lower energy orbit is n sub l, which would be this here. And then the letter B is a constant. It is 2.18 times 10 to the negative 18 joules. So when you're calculating the difference in energy, it would be equal to the constant B times 1 over the lower energy orbit squared minus 1 over the higher energy squared. Now, what if you want to calculate the wavelength of a spectral line that you observe when an electron loses energy. So then you would use this equation here. So you have 1 over the wavelength, this lambda equals wavelength, and B over HC, this is the constant in the equation up above divided by Planck's constant H times the speed of light C. B over HC in and of itself is a constant, okay? So they've given you the value here, 1.097 times 10 to the seventh per meter. So that gets substituted in times 1 over the lower energy orbit squared minus 1 over the higher energy orbit squared. So let's take a look at a practice problem here.
Let's use the equation delta E equals B times 1 over the lower orbit squared minus 1 over the higher orbit squared. And the value for B given to calculate the energy released when an excited hydrogen electron drops from the fourth energy orbit, n equals 4, to the second orbit, which is n equals 2. The B constant given above was 2.18 times 10 to the negative 18 joules times 1 over the lower energy orbit, which is 2, and this is going to be squared, minus 1 over the higher energy orbit, which is 4 squared. So this will be 2.18 times 10 to the negative 18 joules times a fourth minus a 16. And this will be 4.08 times 10 to the negative 19 joules.